Tim as he was walking in. I know that the convention would be at the moment to introduce the speaker to you. And I'm not going to do that. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to introduce the crowd to the speaker. So, so I thought you might like to know who you're speaking to. Um, but before I tell you who you're speaking to, a little bit of historical background. And I met Tim Costello, who's the um, CEO of World Vision Australia, and also the co-chair of um, Make Poverty History on Saturday night. And we started talking a little bit about Israel's aid program and what it was. And I don't know, uh, probably quite, quite a lot of people in the room have been speaking, so they know this. And, and, uh, and if you don't, that the idea of liberating Africa was a central tenet of Zionism and the belief of Peter Herzl from 1990 when he started writing about Israel. And there was this idea that was an idea that was very much at the heart of Zionism of what we are as a liberation movement. And once we've liberated Jews, then we want to go on to liberate others. And this is an idea that Israel was established. To the extent that um, in the 1950s, there was food rationing because we were in the middle of an enormous war. Israel absorbed more population than it actually had in the country. Over a very short period of time, there, like, there wasn't enough food to eat. There were these enormous social and economic problems within Israel. And so within that context, of course, the founding fathers of the country would decide that one of the primary aims of Israeli policy should be international development. And, and that's what, the, what the, big, the roots of the country were. And it was a movement which was grassroots in the most profound way you can imagine in that um, people, like you had the kibbutzes, the agricultural farms, and the universities here, sending lists of people to the government that they that wanted to go to Africa and wanted to do things to, to do well, uh, to, to do good in the world, and wanted to help change things. And there was this enormous momentum at the time in Israel and belief that, that we had a role to play in transforming the rest of the world, it was our responsibility as, as citizens of Israel, and it was our responsibility as citizens of the world. Um, and at that time, Israel, as poor as it was, had a development program which, um, in absolute terms, we had more technical assistance in Africa than any other country in the world than in France, mm -hmm. at a time when, in a country that was very, very tiny. Um, and that all changed. And that all changed in 1973. Because what happened in 1973 was, in 1973, you had almost all African countries breaking off relations with Israel, and it just broke Israel's heart. Like, if there was this unique sense of mission beforehand within the Israeli people, which said that, you know, we see as part of our role joining in brotherhood with the rest of the world in order to try to address these global challenges, after 1973, the feeling was, well, why should we bother if we have our own problems and everyone hates us anyways and why should we do this? And for the course of the next 35 years, there's barely been a development program in Israel. Um, Israel has one of the lowest contributions to international development in any country. Um, and when I started working in the field of international development, I'm the head of the Innovation and International Development Program in Israel. Every time I told people what it is that I do for a living, I got one of three answers. One answer was, what, there weren't enough poor people in Israel. The second answer was, um, but everybody hates us anyways. And the third answer was, but we're a developing country. Um, and for years and years and years, as we've been working in this field here in the university, and trying to build up all this grassroots support for Israel, uh, or for the issue of international development, we just kept hitting those three answers. Now, in the past few years, something has changed. And, and it's really now that we're finding that we're on this cusp of a new generation of people who are returning back to the roots of what Israel once was. In that all of a sudden we have people coming to us and saying, we don't want to work with Israel, and we want to be able to somehow transform or change what's the direction of society here so that we only, don't only think of ourselves, and we do think of global issues of poverty and so on. And um, so I said that I would be introducing the audience to you. These are our foot soldiers. Mm. These, um, I don't know everyone in the room, the ones who I don't know, you don't know that you're our foot soldiers yet, but you become our foot soldiers. So, but you're looking at a lot of the people in this room, in this room are the people who have been coming to us over the past while, particularly, I mentioned to you we did an event about a few weeks ago, but, uh, but not only that, to say we want to be involved and we want to change things and we don't want Israel to only be a working anymore. 
And so within the backdrop of suddenly this new renaissance in Israel, and it's a very much a generational renaissance, it's nobody, very few people over the age of 40, and a lot of people under, like in their 20s and early 30s, um, who are saying this, all of a sudden I found out that Tim Costello was coming to Israel. Um, Tim Costello, for those of you who are less familiar with who he is and what he's done, um, beyond the fact that he's the co-chair of one of the largest development organizations, NGOs in the world, um, uh, World Vision Australia, he's also the, the, the co-chair of Make Poverty History in Australia, which was the most profound grassroots movement globally, and it still exists today, which, through which people throughout the world got up and said, listen, we think that our governments should pay more attention to global poverty, should be giving more to this issue of of how to address the challenges of the poorest people in the world. And, and so the reason that we brought Tim Costello to speak to us today is to share from his experience of, of what it means to have a grassroots movement um, which um, can mobilize people within a country to do more for development. Um, and so we're very, very happy to have you here today. Um, I uh, fully intend on being inspired by you, so I hope that you intend on, on being very inspirational and, and, and hopefully can hand, give us a few trade secrets on the way about how we bring about in Israel the renaissance of, of public opinion in order to drive um, stage two in Israel's role in the world of international development. And so without further ado, Reverend Tim Costello. Thank you uh, very much for that introduction. It's pretty much as I wrote it, really. Um, full of uh, passion and inspiration. And, uh, I uh, have been reading uh, a few of Eliza's articles. Do you want me to sit or uh, stand? Whatever. Okay. Um, now, you, you have some good luck tonight. Um, the actually more technical speech that I came and prepared won't open on my iPad. So at 6.30, you're going to be spared a, a technical speech, so it'll be more a chat and hopefully inspiring too. Um, the second uh, thing I want to say is it's an honour to be here and I have some guests with me and I thought I might introduce them. Uh, Narit at the uh, end lives here in Tel Aviv. She works with Dov Weisslas, who we've been working with on some other issues. Chris uh, is from Bendigo, Australia. Tim, his brother, is Professor of... Uh, Humanitarian law, is that the right term? At uh, the University of Melbourne. He's also an advisor, a member of the Turkle Commission, and he's here to hand that to your Prime Minister on Wednesday, I think. So that's two slips to go. That's been done and dusted, so him, uh, you'll read about it, you'll, you'll see it on TV. Uh, uh, we have Michelle, who's an Australian and uh, doing um, humanitarian law here, yeah. speaks fluent Hebrew. Nitsa, who's a, a great friend of mine, and I'm going to tell a story about her homeland, Nagaland, in a minute. Married to Yaron. Uh, successfully married to Yaron. Uh, uh, yes, and uh, that's because I did the wedding. Uh, I, I don't have too many failure rates, at least there's a warranty for the first 12 months of marriage. Uh, Yaron's in the foreign ministry, has been the Israeli ambassador in uh, Myanmar, and is back here on placement. So, uh, in introducing them, that's some of the, uh, the entourage that, that are with me tonight. You might have other questions of any of them also, uh, as well as me. Uh, I was very inspired to read an article that um, Elisa had written for Jerusalem. Good. And in it, she um, said some things that surprised me, and you may well know this, uh, namely that uh, Israel's uh, aid budget with an economy the size of Portugal's is about $20 million, Portugal's is about $270 million. And I think that uh, whatever way you measure it, says there needs to be a whole lot of foot soldiers and people who say, hang on, wait a minute, let's have a think about our international responsibility. So I want to congratulate you. I won't be talking about that because I know very little about your situation. But I do know that um, in Australia we, through the Make Poverty History, have had a really successful campaign to energise young Australians to say, um, I can make a difference. And poverty is personal. And even though we have 
difficulties here in Australia, our indigenous issues are a terrible shame, third world conditions in a first world country and a long history from our, if you like, white colonisation that has not seen a closing of the gap between white life expectancy and health and education and black indigenous expectancy. So there's about a 20 or 30 year gap in life expectancy and education in the attempt and some. 53% of all young people in detention in prison in Australia are Aboriginal and yet they're 2% of the population. So, we have lots of personal problems and we could say, why are we worrying about the rest of the world? You know, Israel has a whole lot of personal problems, uh, particular national problems. And so I understand very much that article that says, look after ourselves first. Often people who say charity begins at home have a truth. Charity does have to begin at home. If I walk past the person who's hungry or homeless and uh, don't learn to respond to them. I'm rarely going to learn the ethic of responding beyond my own nation. So charity has to be learned at home. But people who say charity begins at home often have a subtext they mean and it begins and ends at home. And funnily enough, most of the people who say charity begins at home, I have discovered, are the ones who aren't doing anything about charity at home. They're usually the ones using that as a defence mechanism to push away other responsibilities. So my view is, we don't have to make a choice here. We are able to do both. Developed countries can do both. And if we uh, believe in um, human rights, universal, inalienable and indivisible, this is Tim's uh, area now, Essentially what those human rights mean is this, as I understand it. I can't walk past someone who's hungry and homeless on the street without there being an ethical tug. And the ethical tug says to me, do, should I do something? Do I throw some money in the, the begging bowl? Do I ask the political question, does our government have enough beds for people who are homeless? Do I refer them to a domestic agency? here that work with the homeless. Whether I respond or not, and whatever the response is, there's an ethical tone. What human rights are the universal means is that if someone's hungry and homeless beyond my nation, then there should be an ethical tone. It doesn't mean I can do everything, but there is a claim on me. Universal human rights actually say if there is something I can do, I should struggle with that question. I should think about that question. I should ask, what is my government doing? And is it acceptable, as Eliza has pointed out, that development aid is so tiny here? You know what happened in 1973, but it's a long time since then. And that rupture is that acceptable still. <coughs> One of the uh, reasons that we now need to develop both ethics at home and global ethics is we no longer really have a choice in the compartments about this anymore. Even if human rights are uh, universal is sort of a theoretical view, it's now very operational, implement implementable reality. <coughs> the world is a waterbed. You press down here, it comes up here. Uh, Mexico got swine flu uh, about four years ago now. We were closing primary schools in Melbourne, Australia. The world's a waterbed. Swine flu knows no global boundaries. When banks with rather funny names got into trouble in America, um, I thought they were funny names. Fanny, May and Freddie Mac. I hadn't heard of them. I just heard of Lehman Brothers. Um, Fanny, May and Freddie Mac. So, what's that? <laughs> Sorry. Um, feel free to interrupt, by the way. I may not get it. I, I have language difficulties in English. Um, when uh, when uh, Fred, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac got into trouble, I hadn't heard of it. My brother was the treasurer in the Australian government for 12, 13 years, Peter Costello. Uh, but 
He's financially literate, I'm not. I, I hadn't heard of him. But suddenly banks all around the world were in trouble, including in Australia. The world is a waterbed. You press down and here it comes up. When uh, we lose forests in Indonesia or in Brazil, though Australia is an island continent, we like to think that um, we're safe, and if there's any troubles beyond our shores, we'll pull up the drawbridge and, and we'll put up the defences. Well, climate change now knows no boundaries with island continents. If we lose those forests, we are in trouble. Australia has been suffering terrible droughts and floods at the same time this last month. The volatility of the weather, the intensity of uh, the fire and the floods, which are now happening all the time, much more regularly, is dropping in Australians' minds. Something's changed. And if the IPCC is right about we cannot avoid now two degrees of warming by 2050, the question is can we avoid six degrees of warming by the 21st century, the 22nd century? We're all affected. It's a global village. So, one of the realities about this global village is that poverty and instability, <coughs> fueled sometimes by conflict, fueled increasingly by climate change, fueled by the profound interdependence of financial systems, means that the distinction between local charity and global charity is now dissolving. To be safe here in Israel, you have to be thinking globally, and that's the global. You probably know a lot about that. Well, let me uh, just take a step back and then talk about Make Poverty History and Millennium Development Goals. Um, Millennium Development Goals, eight goals, very practical. Put poverty in a human rights framework for the first time. Said, uh, we will halve the number of absolutely poor people by definition trying to live on $1.25 a day. You don't really make it on $1.25 a day. You don't live. So I still 20,000 kids die a day under the age of five from preventable disease and dirty water. They said we will cut by two thirds child deaths and maternal deaths. They had an environmental goal. They had a, a goal around levels of giving namely rich countries, which Israel's one, will aspire to give 0 0.7 cents in every $100, uh, 70 cents in every $100, 0.7% of GDP. As Eliza's article makes a point, which is a pretty devastating point, um, in 1963, Israel's aid program was $5 billion when the economy GDP was $2 billion, roughly. Uh, the GDP has grown a hundred times and AIDS only gone up double to about 10 million. Um, well, that's not meeting the Millennium Development Goals, which 192 nations signed up to, including Israel, and said, we are putting poverty in a human rights framework. We are serious. Because we know, apart from it abusing fundamental human rights, Dangerous poverty in a global world spills over into all sorts of conflicts and uh, oppressions uh, and apart from anything else, profoundly affects us in the West. The poor cut down the trees and we're affected. By the way, one of the biggest reforestation programs in Africa, uh, in Ethiopia, the Humbo program, is uh, being conducted by World Vision. Say, are you a green organisation? No, we're a humanitarian development organisation, so why are we doing reforestation? Because when you plant trees and reforest, um, the streams come back, the birds come back, the animals come back, the plants from the trees actually vegetate the soil, uh, and most importantly, Ethiopia, which has lost 95% of its forest, um, where it's women's job to go and collect the, the wood, so the women are having to walk further and further, getting sexually assaulted, sometimes raped, dangerous. When you plant trees, it helps food security. It helps climate change. It's profoundly important for the West as well as for Ethiopians. 
Sorry to name drop, but uh, one of our ambassadors for World Vision is Hugh Jackman, who I'm assuming you've heard of, and he's uh, just uh, been nominated for an Oscar for Les Mis. I took Hugh and his wife to Ethiopia, I've taken them to Cambodia, to a few, a few places. Uh, what was amazing for Hugh in Ethiopia was actually looking at very simple technology, which is really my pitch tonight. Israel, smart, innovative nation and technology, this is the sweet spot for your development work. Then, uh, Hugh didn't realise it, but we planned to get him working with a local farmer and uh, we forgot to get him to change out of his Gucci <coughs> shoes and tight jeans and, you know, brand clothes and anyway he didn't seem to mind next thing he's shoveling manure and rubbish in his Gucci books uh, with an Ethiopian farmer and you'll see a documentary coming out on this soon um, Hugh's putting all this manure with the Ethiopian farmer into a manure pit and then amazed that he's doing this dirty stinking work for about two or three hours no language between them this Ethiopian <coughs> farmer has no idea who Japanese, never heard of it. But when you work together, it's a really interesting lesson that people would some I think understand this. You bond. Without a word in common, you bond. The bonding between Hugh and this guy was quite extraordinary to watch. When you see the documentary, you literally see the chemistry between them. It's, it's quite beautiful. And Hugh turns to me and he says, Why am I putting all this crap, this manure, getting all dirty? And we explained why simple technology. It's called a methane digester. You put a top on this manure. The Ethiopian farmers' houses are all clay, thatched roof. They have a door, but they don't have windows. Don't ask me, but they never have windows. When they collect the firewood, cut down the trees, 95% of the trees gone in Ethiopia. The uh, fuel to cook on for kids to study by is fire. The smoke you literally see leaching out of the thatched roofs because there's no windows. The kids are breathing in, respirate, getting respiratory diseases from the smoke. And when the fire burns low, they can't study at night. We put a cap called a methane digester on these, these uh, manure pits that he was putting in. We then capture the methane because of fermenting manure. You then have a simple pipe that goes straight through the clay walls of the farmer's little hut and he's cooking on gas. A methane which goes off into the atmosphere is captured. It's one of seven greenhouse gases. And uh, then the kids aren't breathing in smoke. They've got electricity to study at night instead of when the fire burns down. They're doing better in school. The women are not having to go so far afield and risk being sexually assaulted because it's only women who culturally ever have to get wood, uh, you get this whole knock on. Well, the uh, person that Hugh was doing this with, uh, Duke Harley, uh, he's a coffee farmer. He's now with energy in the methane digester, became a, a coffee uh, uh, energy provider to the rest of the village. Um, it's a hand up, not a handout. The methane digester costs about $2,000. The first car from his cow uh, has to be given back to the village so someone else can then get a methane, di methane digester. This isn't just charity, this is actually people who are poor wanting to work and pay for what they've got, a $2,000 methane digester, and handing over their calf as, pay as payment and the next family gets one. What you'll see in this uh, documentary is Hugh goes back. He's so impressed by Yurkeshev coffee, 2,000 years ago, the oldest coffee in the world starts there in India. In New York, where Hugh lives now, um, he's launched a fair trade coffee brand, getting coffee beans from Ducali's farm and the area in Ethiopia. The brand's called Laughing Man. Um, Paul Newman is putting it all through his hotel systems. and So here is now an income stream for these farmers who aren't clearing forests, who have methane. Uh, that's fair trade, basically. That means we took you from 
uh, Yurgashev and the rural areas to the stock exchange in Addis Ababa. We got fascinated watching the coffee exchange and the prices and working out the middlemen and who's making money. Why the poor farmers, Jukali, his name wasn't missing out. Well, a very simple technology. But when you think of the achievements in this nation, uh, in innovation, in particularly dry farming agriculture, which is actually what so much of the world's poor need, this nation could be just doing so much. Because, because those skills, that innovation, that experience here is transferable. Well, coming back, the Millennium Development Goals are those set of goals where the world said we really are going to hold up the mirror and see how we're going. Measurable goals, cutting by half the number of absolutely poor. Um, Two thirds uh, are cut in infant and maternal mortality. The amazing thing is, Getting near 2015, we are on the way. We are actually seeing remarkable change. 25 years ago, 60,000 kids died every day beneath the age of five. Two years ago, it was still 30,000 kids. Today, it's 20,000 kids dying every day. Still an obscenity and a blasphemy that so many kids die every day. But, look at the numbers. 50,000, 30,000, 20,000. And the reasons are the world has had measurable goals. Even though we're off track with the Millennium Development Goals, the point about these goals is they're measurable and we know we're off track. You can organise it. That's the great achievement. Now the discussion I'm going to the UN in next month um, in New York is about the post-Millennium Development Goals, 2015 and beyond. So I just want to uh, sit with that first. The world signs up and says Millennium Development Goals and we know it has been working. Some of the reasons it's been working is we have focused on really cheap interventions. The biggest killers of kids are diarrhoea and pneumococcal disease. The vaccinations is a global fund, Gavi, Global Association for Vaccinations has been focusing on vaccinating for pneumococcal disease and measles. We have been focusing on really simple rehydration kits for diarrhoea. We've been focusing on really simple postnatal birthing techniques, just teaching a mother that when a baby's born you've got to wrap it in a blanket. It can die really quickly. Lots of cultures don't get this. Emphasising to our mother, breastfeed, 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 all the time. Really simple things. Saying to mothers, 10% of women around the world have complications in birth. It doesn't matter where you are, they have complications in birth. So if there's evidence of hypertension or prepartum uh, hemorrhaging, get to a clinic or to a midwife. Some of the biggest opposition comes from women in their own culture. Grandmothers, grandmothers say to their daughters who are pregnant, what's wrong with you? We had our babies in the village. And, you know, the shame means that women don't go. But if you're in that 10% and you haven't gone and got that help, you will die. So reducing one of those Millennium Development Goals maternal deaths is just really simple education of 10% of women will die. We actually have to act. Um, focusing on breastfeeding. Focusing on vaccinations. And the world said we will put uh, up to the developing world 0.7%. That was the aim. The aim goes right back to a Canadian uh, foreign minister in the late 60s. He said let people privately give 0.3%. GDP. So that's my private giving to World Vision. World Vision raises $350 million a year from just Australians alone. There's 21 million of us. A billion dollars a year is given privately by Australians alone. World Vision is big. Through, we have 350 million of them. So the idea was people in a nation like Israel should give privately an amount equal to 0.3%. And the Israeli government should give 0.7%. So rich nations are giving 1% to 
for the world's poor. That's where that notion of 0.7 came from. I don't know, Eliza, what the private giving of Israelis is. Uh, well, that's not the <laughs> <laughs> um, Australians are at about 0.2. So Australia, you know, this has been a good story. Unfortunately, the Australian government is only giving 35 cents in every hundred dollars. We promised 0.7. The Dutch are giving over 0.7. The Scandinavian countries, 0.7. The Brits are giving British, 0.5. And they've legislated next year to go to 0.7. Impressive because a Conservative Prime Minister um, slashing and burning the British budget with their recession was under enormous pressure to cut aid. And David Cameron, the Prime Minister, said, we will not balance the books on the backs of the poor. It's pretty impressive, isn't it? Because every domestic political constituency, education and health, says we want the money, not Africa. He said, we will not balance the books uh, on the backs of the poor. So this is where Make Poverty History comes in, if you're wondering where I'm going. Make Poverty History says, we've got Millennium Development Goals, we've got measurements. We know we're off track, but we have made progress. Make Poverty History is a movement to say we are going to be civil society's pressure point for our government to take this seriously. That's why foot soldiers is a good word for you, as if you're part of us. The uh, extraordinary thing is in Australia is we've seen aid go from 0.21% to 0.35% with a promise to go in two years to 0.5%. If you ask Australians how much aid uh, Australians give, they'll say, oh, 5%, but some will say 10%. I often do it like this. I say, here's $100 in 50 cent coins. We have 50 cent coins in Australia. Tell me, how many of those 50 cent coins does our government give to the world's poor? Most Australians will say, well, at least 10 of those 50 cent coins, at least $5. They all believe that. When I hold up one 50 cent coin and say, we don't even give one coin, we're only giving 35 cents at the moment, Australians are profoundly shocked. Your figure is 14 cents. Well, people believe, the point being, that we're much more generous than we are, and they actually want to be more generous, and they find this a bit of a shock. Well, Make Poverty History is saying we signed up with the Millennium Development Goals to 70 cents. We're way off. We also want people privately giving their 0.3, 30 cents. You can measure that. When people say there is so much waste in aid, and I'll get to this, how can Make Poverty History do this? Well, I say this. The, Develop, the developed world spends $120 billion a year in aid. That's the figure. Total. US, European, and Australia. There's $420 billion spent a year in the West on weight loss programs. I don't actually hear people saying weight loss programs are a waste of money and we shouldn't spend that money, do you? There's always a new one out. No one questions $440 billion a year in weight loss programs. So suddenly, $120 billion a year in aid, which is still really small, and it's like, well, why should we? We're being too generous. So Make Poverty History exists as a movement to really hold governments accountable to the promises they have made to the world's poor at the United Nations. You could have a look at what the Israeli government is signing up, made in its promise there. Make poverty history is just three words, and the uh, importance of any great stories is simplicity. If you think of uh, the civil rights movement in America, it was really a few words. It was black is beautiful. Black was slave. Black was ghetto. Black was teenage mum. Black was... Uh, cocaine and crack dealer. Black was a criminal. Black was everything but beautiful. And along comes Martin Luther King and others. It's a really powerful little story. He says, Black is beautiful. I tell in my book, Hope, which uh, 
you can buy it from Amazon or online, just has come out. The story of uh, Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream speech. It's interesting that um, he'd given a form of that speech a few months earlier in Chicago. And Aretha Franklin, a 19 year old, had son. Her father, the Reverend Franklin, was his church. And Aretha Franklin was amazed by uh, Martin Luther King's form of I have a, have a Dream speech. You know the speech we all know? Where he says, I want my four little children to be judged by the character, the content of their character, not the colour of their skin. And they march on Washington. Martin Luther King's there. He's got a prepared speech. Aretha Franklin and her father are on the stage behind Martin Luther King. And Martin's being a bit wooden, it's a bit awkward, a bit uh, stodgy. And Aretha Franklin shouts at him on stage, Martin, tell them about your dream. This 19-year-old blank gospel singer. You heard of Aretha Franklin? <laughs> Have you seen, um, what's her movie? We're on a mission from God. Ruse Brothers, that's her. And you actually see Martin Luther King, he, he, he nods, he hears this, tell him about your vision. He puts away his switch and he literally goes into, I have a vision. Let freedom ring out uh, across America. Well, Martin Luther King and the civil rights movement were energised around something really simple. Black is beautiful. Really powerful. The feminist movement is organised around something pretty simple. That your mother, your sister, you love. The notion that they're not to be abused, that they have equal rights, that this is a really simple, powerful story. The environmental movement is organised around the notion that the earth is our mother. You don't break and pillage and plunder your mother. It gives us life. And we're stewards uh, of this life we have. Really powerful stories, whether it's civil rights, whether it's feminism, whether it's ecology and environmental movements. Now, Make Poverty History aims to be a really simple story. We can make poverty history. We know how. There are simple interventions. It's imagination and political will. We do need foot soldiers. We need the best of the uh, Startup nation, smart Israeli technology, which is extraordinary in this country, engaged. Uh, your minds engaged. Your government knowing that you care. When people say, yeah, oh, but look at our government and how do you change things, you know. I, uh, I've learned, I've had a brother in politics, that it's pretty easy to work out a politician. It's... It saves you time if you know this trick. Basically, a politician is someone walking around going like this. Feeling which way the wind blows. <laughs> the point isn't to convince a politician. The point is to change the direction of the wind. Politicians will go with which way the wind's blowing. You know, that's the theory of democracy. We've never quite worked out why one person, one vote, sometimes gets corrupted by money and the American elections. And... But that's the theory of democracy. Politicians will actually go with the wind. Make Poverty History actually says, let's be that wind. Let's actually be that wind. Say, we are internationalists. We are concerned. Israel has some of the best to offer. And Israelis, young and old, but particularly young people, a series about universal human rights. A story from Nietzsche's country, and I get all this wrong, so she'll tell you the official story about it, right? But I went there to Nagaland, up near Assam and Mizoram, northeast India. You probably haven't heard of Nagaland. And uh, tribal, 40 plus tribes, high up in the mountains, really cold, been fighting for their independence from India, so a lot of strife and you know, civil military turmoil. But what amazed me was uh, how there is such profound connection to land and culture and language. Over 40 different tribal languages. And story and dance. You know, this is 
There's a puzzle for me in development work. I come back from places where I'll never romanticise poverty. You know, poverty's always terrible. But I come back to Australia, which has solved the problem of supply. Like, we've solved the problem of how many mobile phones a 16-year-old girl needs. <laughs> And how many widescreen digital TVs a family home needs. We've solved these massive challenges. And yet, we've got an epidemic of depression among young people. And youth suicide rates that are amongst the highest in the world. And drug use that's scary. And I come back from poor countries where there's dance and land and connection to story. That's why development as partnership isn't just pity. It's not just... We give you money and we've come with a solution. It's actually enriching. We have a problem. It's called an epidemic of depression and a sense of lostness. Well, the Nagas have that in, in heaps. Uh, and their stories and their dance, it's just fantastic. And I remember with Lisa uh, pointing out different Naga people. I think the uh, law bearers wear red or a different colour, and the teachers wear a different colour, I'm not sure of the colours now. And uh, when I saw someone wearing a gold coat, I was quite amazed, gold, knockout, what's this? It was explained to me, this person is someone who's given a feast of merit. And when I said, what's that? They said, don't you have feasts of merit in your country? And I said, I don't know, tell me what it is. <laughs> they said, well, in Naga culture, when you become rich and you have lots of uh, pigs and a barn full of sacks of rice, now, we're all richer than the richest Naga, aren't we, Lisa? <laughs> but rich by Naga culture, you can throw a feast of merit. And that means you throw a feast for the whole village. There are uh, people who are poor or sick or with disabilities. And they come and dance and feast and eat, and uh, the poor, the whole community celebrates. And when all your bags of rice are gone and your pigs have been slaughtered and eaten, when everything's gone, you're, all your assets are liquidated, you're given a gold coat and you start again with nothing. I said, I'm pretty sure we don't have this in Australia. <laughs> now here is a culture that's really good for the Make Poverty History story, isn't it? We came with nothing. How much are we taking when we leave this world? The whole point is actually for now, isn't it? To make a difference, to bless others, to use our skills, innovation <coughs> skills, to give, to celebrate. That's actually the point. That's the story of this three-line story, Make Poverty History. It enriches us too. It's acting out our universal rights. One final story, and a couple of these are in my book. Um, that I want to finish with because we have seen Make Poverty History yet yeah, the Millennium Development Goals make a difference and we welcome you on this journey. Um, one of our operation guys in World Vision, he's uh, based in Boston actually, but he's the international COO for World Vision. His name's Dave Young and as a 20 year old, 22 year old, he's in Africa. And he went on after visiting Africa to work for Boston Consulting, came to, became 2IC for Boston Consulting, still lives in Boston, made squillions, and consultants do, works for us for nothing, giving back. But he was in Africa when he was 20. He was uh, on the back of a truck two hours out from a uh, African capital uh, and bouncing along on the back of a tray on African roads which have potholes big enough to swallow trucks. That's why it might only be you know, 30 kilometres of road, it'll take you an hour to travel. And uh, the track pulls to a halt of massive trees across the road, and the bush is really thick. And they all get out, and they see one lone African on top of this massive trunk with this tiny tomahawk futilely chipping away at this massive trunk. Another truck coming the other way stops. They get out, they walk around through the bush and squeeze around and they realise this is hopeless. They're thinking two hours back, bone jar and journey, what are we going to do? So they back up the truck a bit, get out chains, but then this tree's so massive they can't get the chains around the truck. So they say, what are we going to do? They said, well, we, we have to use human effort. 
So they literally all put their shoulders to this massive trunk. And by now, this amazed Dave, he hadn't been to Africa before, you think you're in the back of nowhere. And no one's around. You're in the bush. But suddenly, out of nowhere, people just start appearing. You don't know who they are. You don't know where they've come from. It's a very African experience. <coughs> These people are enlisted, shoulders to the trunk. And on three, they are told to heave. It's such a dead weight, this tree barely shudders. It's hopeless. They take a breather. More people appear out of the bush. They try it again, and it shudders. It doesn't move. They're about to give up. Someone says, one last go. Let's not die wondering. We've got to go a long way back. Dave remembers this last time putting his shoulder to the trunk. He remembers because this frail, elderly African man come out of the bush. He remembers this man snuggling in with his shoulder to the trunk next to him, next to Dave. He remembers because Dave looked at him and thought, fat lot of good you're going to do. <laughs> Frail and elderly. This African man starts to sing. It's an African song. The Africans know it. The, the whites, they don't. The Africans are clearly waiting and he's singing. And there's a moment coming and there's a crescendo. And then, when it hits a certain crescendo, they all know to heave. And they all heave. And this massive tree trunk moves a centimetre, maybe half an inch. They take a breather. They all put their shoulders there again. You better kill mine, thank you. They put their shoulders again. This African man starts to sink. Dave's ready this time. It hits that crescendo and they heave. And it moves a centimetre. Dave said, we sang and heaved 40, 50 times, centimetre, centimetre, by centimetre, by centimetre, until we moved it just enough for the truck to be able to squeeze through and continue on its way. Dave said it was the most important lesson for his future as a consultant. He said the mission never changed. The mission, it was to move this massive tree trunk. He said the strategy never changed. The strategy couldn't be a tomahawk. walk. The strategy couldn't be chains. The strategy could only be human effort. So, what changed? What changed was a frail African elderly man song. A song that drew out of them something that wasn't there before. A song that got them into alignment. And once in alignment, there was greater energy just to push this assembly. What Make Poverty History is about that I chair in Australia is actually drawing out of people what they haven't known is there, that they can make a difference, that they want to make a difference. Make Poverty History with the Millennium Development Goals is actually getting people into alignment, nations into alignment, civil society into alignment, saying we have made huge progress. We can make this intolerable. There will always be corruption. There will always be a need for far greater governance and transparency and World Vision works strong at this. But alignment around the Millennium Development Goals would probably, I think, one of the greatest United Nations achievements ever. I know in Israel you need the car engine running to make a quick escape if you even say United Nations. <laughs> but I do think that achievement of the Millennium Development Goals, 192 nations signing up to say we're serious about poverty, is our form of this song. So let me finish by inviting you to actually sing that song, to uh, be part of that, to think about the part you play in uh, what is a global ethical issue. Thank you. <coughs>